Hi guys, uh, welcome to Tips and Tricks. Um, I'm Rachel, subbing for Angela, she's gone today. Um, but I just wanted to introduce you, we've got Sam here and Cliff. Sam, if you could introduce yourself. Yep, I'm Sam Staskel with EXP in Wisconsin. And then Cliff. Hey, I'm C2, <laughs> Cliff Freeman <laughs> in Prosper, Texas, just north of Dallas, for those of you who know the C2 and C3 gang here, huh? Yeah. So we've got Cliff today. He's great. He's been an agent for a while. He's got a lot of knowledge that he can bring and help these agents. And one of the things he wants to talk about is the rocket fuel for agents. So Cliff, tell us what that means. Even Sam and I were talking before. What is he going to tell us? Yeah, well, so really the rocket fuel, um, and I'm an EOS practitioner, which is the entrepreneur operating system. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. There's a couple of great books written by the guys that came up with it. And uh, Traction is the one that if I were going to suggest a book that somebody start with uh, for EOS, it would be called uh, the book called Traction. And it really helps outline how to develop structure for a business. And if you have a real estate business, then you need to treat it like a business. Um, you know, there is uh, there are too many of us who get into this industry and you know we have the hopes of of uh, having our own having our own business um you know having our being able to set our own schedule and then there's that promise of untold wealth and you know the reality is is that everybody gets the first two but very few people get the last one which is the money part of it right yeah. so so one reason why there, there are a lot of reasons why but i would say that probably the number one reason why is because people are not treating their real estate business as a business. It's more of a job. And, and for agents who are newer, who came over, say, perhaps from the corporate world into real estate, this might be your first taste, right? At, at pure capitalism, because this is really what's so beautiful about the real estate business is it really is one of the last really free markets. I say free, there's a lot of regulation but for the most part, you can come in with relatively little investment, start a business where you don't have to con you don't have to manufacture the product. Right. We're we're not making houses. We're we're actually selling assets with other people's money. We don't have to go finance the floor plan of like a car dealership where the car dealership has to take ownership of the cars that they're selling. We're actually selling very expensive assets and we don't have to come up with that capital. So it's not a capital intensive business. But the good news is, is that it's very easy to get into. The bad news is it's very easy to get into. And for that reason, you know, we've got 10 times as many real estate agents really as we probably should have to serve the market. So when you get into this noise, um, and I call it noise, it's, for example, in my area in Dallas, we have 40,000 licensed agent, agents who wow. are members of the real estate association, you might guess we, we really don't need that many. Um, but nonetheless, we're all in there competing for the same houses right now. And so one of the things I wanted to do, I really want to try to drop some value to your audience today and, and uh, give them some nuggets that I think will help them uh, you know, get deals done. I want to ask, uh, there, there, there are people probably all over the United States on your call I would bet that many of them are experiencing the same issues that we're experiencing with the market here in Dallas. And that is, guess what? There's no inventory, mm -hmm. right? There's no houses to sell. I mean, look what's happened since COVID. Lumber prices have gone up over 300%. Home yeah. builders right now in our area are allocating like two homes a month in the area subdivisions that they're building in. Many people are having to wait over a year to get a new bill. There are a list, Toll Brothers in my area, just down the road here, has a list of 40 buyers that have already paid deposits and can't, they can't even get the, uh, uh, the subdivision open yet. I mean, it is absolutely crazy yeah. what's going on. We have people, and and you think this is bad. You should take a look at Austin, Texas. It's just insane down there. But in our market, it's not unusual for every house to have multiple offers, and they're typically selling for above list price. Is that pretty consistent with what you guys see? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Arizona's, 
I went to a new build the other day, Cliff, and they had 400 people on the waiting list and they had 18 lots left until oh, wow. they opened the next phase, which they said wouldn't be open till 2023. How, so, uh, how big was that subdivision? That's huge. 400 people. Yeah. Well, it was originally probably this builder. It's huge. It's a huge. There was a multiple builders in there. You know, it was a master plan community. Um, mm -hmm. This builder had about 200 lots to begin with. And their second phase was going to have 250 lots. You know, now math says when they get through that 400, they're going to be able to sell their 250 lots. Not all of them are going to buy. But you're when you're number 401, it's discouraging, you know. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, you know, that's what price point is that? Uh, this was between four and six hundred. Four and six hundred. That's not exactly considered a starter home. I hope in your market, is it? No, it's uh, average home in Arizona is pushing three, three fifty right now. So it's not a starter, but um, yeah, the starter homes those those wait lists are even crazier. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we're having to fill up. You know, these millennials waited. They all were living with their parents and so forth, and now they've decided they want to get out and have their own property. None of them want to live downtown. They all want to live out where they can get some open space. So there's huge demand out in the suburbs. Well, so as a real estate agent, if you're a buyer's agent, what are some of the issues that you come across when you're trying to serve a buyer's agent? I mean, there's a lot of them, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, there's no inventory. So that means that there are, it's very difficult, you know, to find a home for somebody. And when you go to showings, we have, I, I saw on the news yesterday, it's so bad here now they're, when they, they're, they're, they're like um, announcing showings like movie premieres, like on Saturday yeah. at 10 is the first showing and there'll literally be 50 cars. It's like vultures coming in, you know, to get that first look at the house and so forth. So as a buyer, how do you compete with that? I mean, what are you guys doing in your, in your uh, neck of the woods to get your buyers a strategic advantage? Is there any kind of strategies or tactics that you're currently using? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you um, here, we're, we're doing a lot of different things. People are waiving appraisals. Okay. Um, they're offering to pay over appraised value, um, okay. reducing inspections periods, taking them as is, um, things like that. Um, one of the things that I do is I also, um, some buyers don't want to write a letter about themselves. I write a letter about me because I'll tell you when I'm a listing agent, I want to know who I'm working with. And so I put that and try to make their offer stand out about this is who you get to work with. So lots of different things where, you know, if you can do a well-rounded offer, sometimes it's not just that price. It's does it meet the need? A lot of post occupancies right now, letting the seller say stay in for 30, 45 days while they find a place to go. Um, so being very strategic and uh, kind of brainstorming, thinking outside of the box to make it happen. Um. I wanted to ask you guys, have you seen, uh, and I don't know, is Homeward in your market yet or Up mm -hmm. Equity or Ribbon? Do you, no. have, do you have anybody, a third market vendor that's coming in and offering to fund your clients so that they can walk into these multiple yes. office situations as a cash buyer? So Open Door is actually, do you guys have Open Door in Texas? We do, yeah. Open Door just rolled out an email, I think, last week saying, They'll basically come in, guarantee the amount the buyer's offering. If they don't get the loan, offer open door will buy it for that price and close on it and then either give them a little bit more time or put it in their inventory of ones to flip or hold, basically. Well, I can tell you, if you don't have it yet, it's coming. It's around the corner. You're going to have more options than open door. Um, Homeward, for example, is not, even though um, Tim Heil is with KW, it's not a brokerage. Um, Open Door is just a finance company and they have a mortgage company um, whereby if you use their mortgage company, you can actually roll some of those fees up into the loan transparently. I mean, you'll see it. It's not going to, they're, they're thin enough so they don't have to, the margins they have are, are, are tight. So they don't really have to bump the rate that much, but it, it's almost a free service to your client. So we're seeing a lot of that here um, where we're having to, take a seller. Selling a house is not hard, but we've got to focus on the hard part and that's buying the home. Do you realize, um, I have a friend here who surveyed 363 of her past clients in the fourth quarter of 2020. And she, there was a very simple question she asked her past clients. Are we in a buyer's market or a seller's market? And do you know what? 83% of them answered buyers. 
we're in a buyer's market. Okay. People don't, they're not even there until they get into the middle of the fight and then they go, Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Right. So what, what it means is, is that we've got to really prepare and educate our sellers so that they know in advance what's going to happen, which means we have to get them to focus on the buy side. Okay. And when you're out on a listing appointment, you really need to have a strategy about how you're going to beat other agents and, or how you're going to win a listing. And if you go out there and you show them that you're a great listing agent and can sell, I hate to tell you this, but even agents who are just new in the business can probably get it done as well as you can. Okay. Now, I mean, I'm not taking credit away where credit's due, but on the other hand, the skill set involved, it's not like it was in 2011 or 10 or 11 yeah. where you had to really work to get homes sold. Okay. So if you can focus on the buy part and have a strategy for them, whether it's buying first, right? Right. Or like Andy Franklin with EXP in Houston, his father, Jimmy, came up with a program years ago. They do 1,500 transactions a year, 1,500. Many of them, most of them are builder deals. You know what they do? All they do is they'll take somebody who's buying a new build, and say it's a deal with Highland Homes or whoever it is, they will guarantee the sale of that purchaser's existing home for X amount of dollars so that there's no contingency with the builder. Now, builders now are requiring the, all contingencies be removed at roof here in our area. As soon as the roof goes on, you got to sell your house and go live in a trailer for a while. Okay unless you have some type of a guarantee. So what I want people, what I want your audience to think about are, okay, think about ways that you can add value. It's not about who, how good you are at selling a house right now. You are a problem solver. We're going to have the same issue come up soon. There are 10.1 million homes in this country that are in default. Mm -hmm. Now compare that with 2000. 10 and 11, when we only had 2.3 million homes underwater, okay, or in default, I shouldn't say underwater. That's almost, that's about four times at the bottom of the great housing crisis. That's the shadow inventory that we have. The government's been kicking that can down the road for a long time. Now, what happens when that inventory hits is another story. We don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. but one thing for sure is the servicers cannot continue to pay the investors cash flow when they don't have anything coming in to them. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So something systemically is going to break here if the government doesn't step in and either they're either going to have to buy people's houses or they're going to have to give people you know more money to be able to catch up their mortgage payments or whatever. And not everybody is right side up. I mean, there are still some people that minus transaction costs and everything else who are going to be short sale contenders. So the, the thing right now in this market is to, you've got to skate to where the puck is going. Okay. Right. Where are rates going right now? Are you guys keeping track of rates? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're up about a half a point in the last week and a half. Okay. I mean, we're hoping they're going to stay here. MBA says they could be at 3.4% by the end of the year, the mortgage bankers association. Every time we see a full point, increase in interest rates at this level, it reduces someone's buying power by about 10%. Yeah. And that's really what's fueled the increase. Low rates have fueled the increase in home prices, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's cheap money. I mean, you can borrow a lot more at two and a quarter, two and a half than you can at three or three and a three and a half. Okay. So, Think about, be strategic as you're, as you're talking with buyers. And right now, we haven't even seen the worst of it, guys. It's going to be worse this spring. I mean, yeah. we're going to be pulling our hair out trying to get people into houses after they sell. Okay. So if you want to be successful in the spring market, you've got to come up with a strategy. Maybe that's working with your independent banker to work on a bridge loan for people so that they can buy that house first and then sell the one that they need to sell, sell their personal house. But you've got to think about which problem is it that I need to solve. And right now, I hate to tell you, but it ain't it ain't selling the house. Yeah. It's about what are you going to do after the home sells? 
Okay. Yeah. So anyway, some of the things that we're doing here, we just partnered with a mortgage company and, and I've got the mortgage company and some investors who are going to set up those programs in-house for us. So we'll be able to go out and have our clients make cash offers on homes with multiple offer situations with a quick close. Okay. Once that's done, then our clients can go ahead and move into the house. They can rent it from us and give them time to get their home sold, which it's going to sell in a matter of days here, you know, a few short days anyway. So the cost of doing that, there's very little carrying cost. You know, the, the, the finance company makes a fee. They're happy with it. They're going to get their money back in this market. It's a perfect, you know, scenario with new bills. Maybe you want to talk with your broker and see if you can work with a, maybe a hard money lender or somebody who would guarantee the sale of that home so that they can go ahead and live in it until they close on their new home and potentially put it on the market, say 30 days before, so they could time it. But you want to waive that contingency for the buyer with the builder. Otherwise, they're going to have to move twice or come up with another strategy in order to get into that house. So I don't know if that's what builders are requiring in, in your neck of the woods, but here they, they will not take any more contingency contracts. They want it sold two or three months sold two or three months ahead of time, or they'll put it back out for somebody else to buy who who's right. non-contingent. It's yeah. tough. It's brutal out there. Yeah. yeah. So does this make sense? Do you guys, do we have any questions from the audience at all? Or? I don't have any right now, but I wanted to just kind of elaborate on what you said, Cliff. It was so great. I watched a video this morning um, about our job right now is to be problem solvers. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of, you know, most agents, they want to go on their Facebooks and brag and go, I sold this house in two days or yada, yada, yada. And that doesn't really help the market with our inventory, right? What helps the market is figuring out what problem do we need to solve for our sellers? Right. You know, and one of the questions he said to ask, which I thought was really good was, what do you want to do? If you were to sell your house, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? You know, there's so many people who would go, I've always wanted to live on the beach maybe it's time they take that equity and you help them downsize and go live on the beach. Or, you know, I've had friends who, Hey, I'm going to go live in an RV while I wait for my, my, you know, new build of my dream house to be done. Sell my house at this top end and they're living in an RV, you know, making memories with their families kind of, you know, going around, you know, especially with COVID they can do this. So one of the questions that I think, you know, even I was kind of realized that I don't ask, what do you want to do? Sure. Where do you, to go because most sellers right now are going well if i sell my house where am i going to go where do you want to go yeah. let's find out what they want to do what have they always what is their been their dream been and then let's problem solve to get them there and get their house on the market to help with the inventory issue yeah you know i, I totally love what you just said in fact my mentor when i was 30 years ago in the business told me one question you want to ask every seller is what are your plans after the home sells that's a nice way to find out their motivation and where they're headed. And, you know, then you can sort of carve and work your way around that. I mean, asking questions is, is the key to success in our business. And if you're, if you're struggling on a listing appointment or getting buyers to sign buyer tenant rep agreements or that sort of thing, I promise you, it's not because they're not willing to work with you or, or they're not willing to sign the document. You're just not asking the right questions. Yeah, and you've got to learn. Scripts are great. Scripts are awesome. But if you walk into someplace, sound like you're scripted, then you're going to get treated just like the rest of them. I mean, you've really got to, to think of this more as you're a consultant, again, about problem solving. You know, when you walk into the doctor's office, what's the first thing he asks you? How are you feeling? Where does it hurt? Yeah. How are you feeling? Right. Yeah. Makes sense. So. <laughs> We've got to be a little more along those lines. Yeah. I think well, um, in my area, you know, I don't work with a lot of new builds, but um, there just aren't a lot of new builds. I've been trying to eliminate the contingency of selling their home to, you know, getting them with a lender to remove that because it makes the offer so much. Stronger. Right now in the market, there's no way they're going to accept a contingency like that. And that's what I tell them. And they're like, well, so we can't buy. I'm like, no, you have to find another way or you're never going to win. Um well, yeah. and especially people moving from out of state, you know, they don't have the, you, you, there's no way you can put your house on the market, get it under contract 
jump on a plane and immediately go find a house. Right. It could take weeks and weeks to find a house and then securing the assets. Another issue, trying to get a winning bid on it. Yeah. It's something else. You've got to take, help the client manage the risk in the transaction. Yeah. We're really becoming risk managers right now. We're helping minimize the risk, the financial risk, the property risk, all of that stuff for the clients. So think about how does insurance work? Insurance kicks in when something bad happens. Okay. Well, if uh, you know, we, the, the builder doesn't want the, nobody wants the risk of somebody right now not being able to move in. So how do we remove it? We've got to come up with ideas and strategies and that's how companies like Homeward and Up Equity and Riven and others are coming in to fill that market need. But you don't just necessarily have to go to them. There are ways to work with local lenders and even local hard money people because they want to earn a fee. You can earn two points on a loan that's going to be out for 90 days and, you know, at a five and a half percent interest rate, you know, look at that and see if it's something that maybe makes sense for you to be able to guarantee the sale or have your client operate as a cash buyer in a multiple offer situation. You've got to be creative. Otherwise, you're going to wind up just like everybody else. And that's in the middle of the pile. And that's not where you want to be. Yeah. Well, Cliff, we really appreciate you coming on here. These were great tips. Um, if you're a newer agent or even an experienced agent watching this and you need help coming up with ideas to get more listings, to get your buyer's offers accepted, and you want to know what we're doing at EXP with those things and things we offer our clients, reach out to any of us on this call. We'd be more than happy to chat with you. And let's go be successful agents. Thanks, guys. Thank let's you. go beast mode. How about that? <laughs> yeah, beast mode. See you later. <laughs>